Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. I just wanted to make a couple preliminary uh, type of concepts about the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland, I've been studying uh, my whole career, and I think it came obvious when a student thought there was only one. Actually, there's two of them, each sitting on top of the kidneys. It has a cortex, and inside is the adrenal medulla, in which I spent a lot of time studying, especially the role of epinephrine and other components, especially endogenous opiate peptides, which are also released that are sometimes forgotten in the issue, and we're still starting to learn about that. The reason why it's so important to understand what I call adrenal exhaustion is because every task that requires high strength power and the repetitive use of those high strength power activities has an adrenergic component. And that adrenergic component for the muscle is very important, and that is that epinephrine goes down to the beta-2 receptors and basically enhances the ability of the myosin motor to produce force by increasing calcium release, by allowing the troponin to be more upregulated to be responsive to the activity of, of muscle contraction with regard to sliding filament. And then also the fact that with repetitive use and repetitive time, the adrenal gland is like anything else. It's trainable because the contents of the Cronfin cells that basically exist are trainable entities that we've seen and published recently. And different training programs train it differentially. And also the fact that if you have repetitive use, not enough recovery, sleep loss, a whole host of different things, dietary problems, it all relates to this type of adrenergic downregulation, especially at the receptor level. And not only does epinephrine go to the muscle, it goes to a host of other glands, and basically from digestive to heart to lung and to smooth tissue. So the bottom line is this is a very important major component of the nervous, sympathetic nervous system, and it's innervated neurologically. If you look at the cortex with cortisol, you got to remember that as epinephrine is produced, it runs through a portal circulation that actually tells the adrenal cortex that this stress has been experienced. And when that stress is experienced, you get the whole phenomenon of cortisol production that takes much longer and can persist for, for hours and days. And in fact, there's nothing wrong with cortisol, but in fact what happens is that it, in the attempt to reduce the amount of glycogen use, to keep metabolism going, it has a lot of collateral damage that can occur from downregulation of immune cells to actually looking at inhibiting protein synthesis signaling me mechanisms. So we have a lot of different aspects that the adrenal gland is very vital and rest and recovery and proper sequencing of programs in the area of physical training is really important and that's what we're kind of getting at here. So it's really a function of understanding the different things you're doing to the body, what's being experienced by the warfighter, what's being experienced, and how you can then allow for rest and recovery. Do we know it all right now? No. Do we have some ideas? Yes. This is an ongoing area related to recovery research and the ability to perform activities on a moment's notice. And I may ca make one ca causal statement. If I'm reacting to something right now, like getting out of the way or having to do something quickly, that's my nervous system doing it right away. It's the after effect and the continual use of it that affects the adrenal gland and how your epinephrine goes, or when you've got enough time to prepare. Another study we did, we showed that prior to high power tasks that you know are coming, you elevate epinephrine in order to be ready to do that task. So there's lots of things going on here, and we'll take some time for questions at the end. But we just want to overview that, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce a uh, doctoral fellow of mine who's been with me for quite some time now. She's, we're at Ohio State, and basically uh, she has done much in her career and has the experience and the exposure of both being a combat vet as well as understanding a lot of the physiology we're dealing with with regard to warfighter uh, physiology and endocrinology. So without further ado, do, let me introduce Tinda Sivak to you. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Dr. Kramer, thank you for that introduction. Very kind, as always. <coughs> so today we're going to talk about adrenal stress or adrenal fatigue. It goes by a number of different names. Um, this is just an overview of some of the things we're going to talk about uh, to give you a better idea. So first and foremost, for those of you in the audience who are military or work with the military, you know that the battlefield has a number of different physical requirements. Uh, at the top of that list, arguably, is strength and power. Okay? So just by a show of hands in the audience, how many military people do we have here? Okay, how many people run five days a week? Not very many. Seven? Okay. How many people lift more than three times a week? Okay. That's because you all are very smart, <coughs> all right? Um, from my experience in the military and something that's been echoed over and over by my peers, we run a lot. Uh, we have a lot of low back injuries, and then we go to war, and we don't run a lot, but we have to lift heavy things many, many times um, over the course of, you know, six, seven, all the way to 14 months. Uh, so you can imagine that puts a lot of demands on the physical body um, and can also affect you mentally if you're not prepared for it. We know that when we're at war, you'll be faced with load carriage, environmental factors such as high altitude, desert climate, sometimes extreme cold. You'll also have to deal with um, psychological factors. Sometimes you don't know what those might be and just the general ambiguity of the situation you're in. You don't know what to expect. You might not know what is going to face you the next day. So all of that creates an awful lot of stress for someone to deal with, particularly, particularly if they are weak or unprepared. If we look at the military's definition of readiness, basically what it means is it's the physical ability, mostly physical, to basically accomplish the mission. Right? How you do that differs according to your training and according to uh, the unit that you're in. But the bottom line is, readiness is the ability to accomplish whatever mission you're given. If we look at the two definitions of readiness and resilience, we can see that the two are very closely related. So if readiness is the ability to accomplish missions through resilience, and resilience requires the ability to be able to, be, to, be able to cope with adversity, you really can't be ready for the mission if you are not resilient, right? From a physical perspective, physical resilience is simply the ability to cope and meet the demands of a variety of physical stressors, whatever that might be. And they will be different depending on the type of unit you're in, depending on the mission. Some of the physical factors that will affect your readiness and resilience are listed right there on the left-hand side. I put strength and power at the top because I think they're very important and often neglected, but that's not the only thing that you have to focus on in the military. You have other things, you know, local muscular endurance, cardiovascular factors, flexibility, and of course, movement capabilities that are related to the specific job. Something that maybe is a little bit less emphasized, but I think becoming more and more important, particularly for uh, those of you sitting in this room, is recovery, right? So it's not just how hard we train and how much we beat the body up to perform, it's how we recover from those demands. So if recovery is not optimal, the soldier will not perform. And it's not just recovery from one specific exercise or you know, eight to 12 weeks of a program, it's recovery from the mission, it's recovery from deployments, and also dealing with factors faced at home that are sometimes neglected and overlooked. So this is just to give you a better idea of some of the threats to physical performance. On the left-hand side, you have different things that will affect a soldier's performance just from a physical preparation perspective. So you have your strength, power, endurance capabilities. If any of those are lacking, you'll definitely feel it. You also have things such as injury. A prior injury will affect how you perform. If you're doing a lot of running, if you're constantly under metabolic stress from varying uh, exercise programs or other reasons, that will affect how you perform on the battlefield as well. And then in the bottom right corner, sleep loss, nutritional issues, and also stressors faced at home that sometimes go overlooked. So what is stress? 
Basically, stress is uh, quite simply the body's adaptation to a demand, whatever that demand might be. So we face stress every day in our normal lives. A lot of times you'll hear stress referred to as the fight or flight response. So it is actually a, a necessary phenomenon. It's meant to be temporary, but it allows us to respond adequately to whatever demands are placed on us. Without stress at all, you just would have a hard time uh, performing, performing well, I should say. So as Dr. Kramer mentioned briefly at the very beginning, you have two primary um, pathways involved with the stress response. You have the hypothalamic pituitary axis and also the sympathetic nervous system. So during stress, you have cortisol re release from the adrenal cortex, and then you also have your catecholamine release uh, simultaneously from the adrenal medulla. So you have increased stress, the hormones are increasing in their attempt to meet that challenge. Under normal circumstances, you will have an end, right? An end to whatever stress you're facing, um, whatever that might be. So when that happens, there's no longer that demand to adapt. You, your body has already met that challenge, so you'll see a decrease in the cortisol secretion as well as a decrease in the catecholamine release, which a lot of you, if you've ever experienced that, um, let's say, for example, you jumped out of a plane for a parachute uh, jump or something, you have that extreme catecholamine release just from the stress itself, but then hours later, everything sort of crashes and you calm down. Um, that's basically what's happening there, right? There's no longer a stressful event, so your body no longer has to react in that particular manner. So when everything's healthy and everything's good, after a point in time, uh, homeostasis is restored again and life is good. So what happens when stress continues, okay? If we think about our lives in general today, I'm sure a number of you in the room, when asked, you could say, I'm under a lot of stress, okay? What does that mean? So back in the day, um, hunter-gatherer times, the stress you faced might have been hunting for food or getting attacked by an animal. Today, we're faced with a number of different ones. For soldiers, you know, it's, it's um, the mission, but it's also things faced at home. It's the demands of work. It's the demands of juggling your responsibilities to your family, trying to train for your mission, and then actually going and doing that mission. So what that means is you're under stress constantly. A lot of times that signal, uh, stress signal simply does not terminate, right? So what does that do to the body? So you'll hear a lot of terms being thrown around. You'll hear chronic stress, right? You'll hear overtraining, adrenal fatigue, adrenal exhaustion, and adrenal insufficiency. So a lot of those are really um, definitions or names for kind of the same thing, although there's a range, a range of uh, effects all the way from chronic stress to the more severe adrenal insufficiency. So what is adrenal insufficiency? Quite simply, it's complete overload when you are so overwhelmed that your body simply cannot respond to the magnitude of stress that it's facing, okay? Over time, if your body is constantly cranking out cortisol and catecholamines and attempting to meet the demands that, you're, that the body is um, under, it simply can't produce as much as is necessary so the glands become depleted. So is it just one thing that causes chronic stress or adrenal insufficiency? The answer is no. It's not just, I worked out really hard in the gym this week, and so now I'm in this chronic stress situation. It's cumulative, right? It's the demands of the job, the home life, the deployment, the workouts themselves, and usually it's all of that together, and there may be something that simply tips the balance, and um, that person is now in trouble. And it is a very fine balance between being in an optimal training state, being stressed enough so that you're performing, and then veering into where you're overstressed and no longer performing. Some of the contributing factors with chronic stress are overtraining in general, so simply too much, right? Too high of an intensity, too much endurance training without recovery, 
And then you combine that with operational demands of varying kinds that we've already talked about. When you are in a chronically stressed state, the hallmark of that is that your performance and your exercise capacity drops. You're no longer able to sustain performance at high levels. Individuals who are chronically stressed are more likely to become sick. They're more likely to suffer from depression and other symptoms. Right there in the red is something that's really important. For those of you who are in the military or work with the military, you know that soldiers pride themselves on their ability to perform and will often push through a lot of pain, a lot of uh, hardships to perform and do the mission. A lot of times that performance is not because of a stress state, not because of physiological overload, it's despite that, okay? There's a big difference between that and um, actually performing optimally. One example I have for you is um, a study that was done by Lieberman in, um, it was done on sleep deprivation, heat, dehydration, and undernutrition. It was done during a field exercise in a group of rangers. And basically what they found was that cognitive performance, decrease, cognitive performance decreased so much so, it's over there on the right-hand side, that black bar. Uh, and if you look at that white bar, that is the cognitive decline from being intoxicated, right? So you can see that from just lack of sleep, inadequate nutrition, and dehydration, your cognitive performance decreases almost, well, more than double, right, compared to if you were drinking. So that's pretty important. So if our soldiers are so stressed during a deployment, this is just a field exercise, but you can imagine a real life situation where you have dehydration, sleep loss, inadequate nutrition, that cognitive performance can make or break that soldier's performance on the battlefield. Some of the symptoms of chronic stress, there are many, um, but fatigue is one, irritability and depression, loss of appetite and other issues, joint pain, So you can see that these are symptoms that you might have experienced yourself. They're symptoms that you might have experienced during deployment, and you can easily confuse them with just being sick in general um, or not feeling well, when in fact it could be a result of the stress that you're under. On a more, um, on a larger scale, chronic stress is linked to other things such as metabolic syndrome, syndrome insulin resistance, and hypertension. We've already talked about the effects of um, chronic stress on memory and cognitive function, as well as on the immune system. So from this list alone, you can see that if we allow our soldiers recovery, we can increase their performance by mitigating some of the effects that chronic stress has, both acutely and then over the long term. Speaking uh, specifically about endurance exercise, why is this a problem? Well, first and foremost, why is endurance exercise done so much? A lot of it's tradition. A lot of it is ease of implementation. If I have a group of 100 soldiers, it's a lot easier to take them on a run than it is to take those 100 soldiers to the gym. And so a lot of leaders within the military default to endurance exercise as a mode of training. Um, it's, it's used as a tool to harden soldiers, and it has a role in camaraderie for sure. Um, but it can be problematic when it's the only way soldiers train. The reason for that is lack of recovery primarily. You don't focus as much as needed on strength and power. And then when you're doing a lot of other things on top of just running, you increase the total amount of oxidative stress that's placed on the soldier. Um, running alone is known to generate a lot of oxidative stress which negatively affects cell health, okay? So with all these issues with um, <clears throat> endurance exercise, one of the most pressing issues is that with chronically endurance trained athletes, you see a decrease in testosterone. So if you're a soldier and you're trying to perform optimally and you have decreased testosterone, you're gonna have issues, right? You won't be able to put on the muscle mass that you might desire, your strength will suffer, <coughs> bone, Bone mass might go down, 
and just general mood will decrease. A lot of um, military schools are designed to be taxing by nature, and that's understood. Um, but the key is sort of trying to enhance optimal performance when you're not in one of those uh, training circumstances. So for example, Ranger School, um, Dr. Nindel saw decreased uh, testosterone after soldiers went through Ranger School, but increased cortisol levels. So basically, that's just indicative of a catabolic state. You might see something similar going through selection. You'll see that after a deployment, possibly, depending on what the stresses were there. But the key is, after those training events, when you can't really mitigate the, um, the performance decline, you want to highlight and optimize the recovery when you're home and when you have a chance to recover. So how do we do that? One of the ways to do that is through resistance exercise. Resistance exercise in and of itself is known to induce hormonal changes such as increased testosterone, increased growth hormone that has a net effect of increasing strength and hypertrophy of muscle tissue. So just thinking about that, if endurance ex exercise causes catabolism, generally speaking, and oxidative stress, but res resistance exercise has the opposite effects, it would make sense for a soldier to incorporate a lot of resistance exercise into the program to mitigate some of the things that they commonly see. Another thing that we'll talk about briefly is metabolic conditioning. A lot of times soldiers will do a lot of short rest workouts um, that definitely have their use and they're done to increase work capacity, increase buffering capacity, and also they're, they're time effective. Um, so they definitely have their place, but they should be done with care. Why? Primary reason, again, goes back to recovery. <clears throat> so you have a soldier who's doing unit PT five days a week. On top of that, they might be doing metabolic training. On top of that, they might be doing a road march, a field exercise, some patrol. Um, so you can imagine that's a lot of stress on the body, okay? And one person might be able to handle that very well, another person might not. But in general, when you're looking at unit readiness, it's not the individual soldier, it's how is that team performing. So if you have a weak link in the chain and you have one soldier who's doing all this and not able to recover, that's going to affect the whole team and how that team functions on deployment. This was a study done by Dr. Kramer back in 1987, looking at a short rest workout in two groups, a group of bodybuilders and a group of powerlifters. And this is just an example for you to see, I know that's hard to read, to see the uh, magnitude of stress that a, that a short rest workout can generate. On the left-hand side, you have heart rate. So you can, on the, on the left-hand, so where you have the heart rate, you can see it's over 180, 160, 180 beats per minute consistently over the course of this workout. Lactic acid is also high. Um, <clears throat> at the highest, you see about 20.0 millimoles per liter. Again, you can see lactic acid here. And when we look at the catecholamine response to this particular short rest workout, that red line there indicates the catecholamine response you would see in response to a maximal exercise uh, a treadmill test. So the values seen in this particular short rest protocol were much, much higher than what you'd see in a max treadmill test. So you can imagine how much stress that creates just in one workout, right, without incorporating rest periods. So it's definitely something to be aware of. Another study we did in our lab was looking at a short rest uh, workout protocol. We looked at cortisol, lactate, and some other things. On the graph, you can see the highest cortisol levels were 15 minutes and one hour post-exercise. And this was a descending protocol. I know it's difficult to read. Um, but basically, the cortisol generated in that workout alone, one resistance training workout with short rest, was 1, 000, almost 1,400 okay, nanomoles per liter. That's very high. On this hand, this side, you can see the same, same workout protocol. You have on the top, total work, and on the bottom, uh, again, total work, but the, uh, the comparison to heart rate and rating of perceived exertion. So basically, what this is telling you, over the course of this particular workout, 
the total work is decreasing, but heart rate remains high, and rating of perceived exertion remains high. Okay? So your soldiers feel that they're working hard, their heart rate is telling you that they're working hard, the total stress is decreasing over the course of the workout, but because of the short rest, the cortisol and the lactate response, so the overall stress generated is high. So I can answer that question at the end. Um, so you can see that when you have a short rest workout protocol, you do have to take, pay attention to the amount of stress that generates. And keep in mind that this is one single workout. So over the course of a week, over the course of a month, you want to pay attention to managing the amount of stress and the magnitude of um, demands placed on the soldier. OK, so what does all this mean? We're talking about stress. We're talking about the negative effects, how it has to be managed, and all those things. Um, why should we care? And you know, is, is stress the enemy at the end of the day? The answer is not necessarily. Stress can be bad, but it also can be good. Like we mentioned briefly, stress is necessary for performance. It's a question of optimal stress. Okay, So you can see here on this graph, we saw a similar one yesterday. On the left-hand side, you're chill, you're relaxed, life is good. In the middle, you're able to perform, you're focused, you can complete the task at hand. On the far right, when you're getting into the red area, now you have overload. Performance goes down, you start to suffer some health effects, and you burn out. Okay? Some of you, I'm sure, have seen this in yourselves or with your soldiers. There's a concept known as stress hardiness. Stress hardiness is simply an, ability, an individual's ability to handle and bounce back from stress. It kind of goes hand in hand with resilience as we defined it at the beginning of the presentation. Why do we care about stress hardiness? Why do we care about resilience? Well, basically, in the military, we try to prepare soldiers for the stresses that they'll face. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as stress inoculation. Simply, it's exposure to a stressful event before the stressful event actually occurs. Can someone tell me what that sounds a lot like? Basic training. Yeah, sure. Training, right? Stress inoculation is simply a form of training. So soldiers who are repeatedly trained on combat-specific tasks and exposed to those tasks before they actually face them in deployment will have a better time actually performing under stress, right? There's a lot of variables that you can't control when you're on the battlefield, obviously. However, training and being prepared will help you perform when you are in that situation. Resistance exercise itself, of course, is a stressor, much like um, many other stressors. You have physical stressors, you have mental ones. There's a, there's a broad range. Resistance exercise, if you take a, an untrained individual and you put them through a workout, that will represent a challenge of some kind, and it will, it will stress them, right? However, over time, they adapt to that stressor, and they perform better. So resistance ex exercise has use in performance and has enhancement and in improving tolerance to acute stress. The interesting thing is, when you put somebody through a physical challenge, okay, Let's say I make you do a deadlift, you're really weak, it's 150 pounds, and you're struggling. Three months later, I ask you to do it again, and you've been working out hard, and now 150, 150 pounds means nothing. It's light. So your stress response has decreased as, as, in response to your training level. The other interesting thing is, not only does resistance exercise decrease your acute stress response, over the long term, it can have impact on how you respond to other stressors. Okay? A physically fit person will be less likely to suffer the effects of illness. If they're going through psychological things at home, if they're going through difficulties otherwise, whatever those might be, they'll be better able to handle that stress. Yesterday we heard in one of the talks about working out and um, the gym being a form of therapy. This is a perfect example. One of the uh, best examples I can give you of how physical fitness reduces your susceptibility to other stressors is um, the military's survival evasion and resistance, your SEER school model. Okay? 
There's a number of studies that came out from those, um, from Sears School. A lot of them are looking at neuropeptide Y response, catecholamines, other hormones. Uh, but one of those studies in Morgan in 2001 basically found that when you have physically fit soldiers, their stress response was a lot different than non-physically fit soldiers. When I say non-physically fit, I should clarify. This particular um, study was comparing special forces soldiers with conventional soldiers. So you can imagine the level of training is a little bit different between the two groups. Um, two guesses which one had decreased stress responses. Exactly, yeah. Um, but that's just one example of what can happen with training. So the bottom line is, with resistance exercise, we can make our soldiers more resilient to stresses of varying kind. We will see improved mission performance if they're incorporating strength and power into the, into the training plan, increased load-bearing capacity, recovery will improve, and immune function will improve. So if we fix all those things, if we improve all of those, we also improve the stress response for that soldier. So then the question is, okay, we want to make our soldiers more resilient. Well, how do we train? Do we put them through five days a week of running? No. We start with an overall needs, needs analysis of that soldier. Okay, What does he require as an individual? What does he require as a member of a unit? What are the specific needs that the unit has? So what is the soldier's job, his uh, occupational specialty? What is the unit's deployed mission, right? What's the likelihood that they'll encounter certain types of tasks when they're on the battlefield? Then we have to take other things into account, such as prior injuries, um, performance requirements such as strength, endurance. You can read that for yourself there. And then finally, we manipulate the acute program, program variables accordingly, whether that's the choice of exercise, the volume, the rest periods, um, the number of sets, all of that, to come up with some kind of a workout program to optimize their performance. For warfighters specifically, strength and muscular endurance are required, as is recovery. So I think you've heard me say it a couple times now, recovery is key. It's not just what we do in the gym, but how well we allow recovery from those demands. And then we have to keep specificity in mind. What exactly are the mission tasks? You can see here that the distribution of training for a warfighter is going to vary. Okay? On the one end, you have strength. On the other end, you have muscular endurance. It's not going to be the same for a support soldier as it will be for a special forces soldier or somebody who's doing a more physically demanding job. Um, so, you, you know, an evaluation of the unit requirements is necessary to develop what would be an optimal program for that soldier. Two things to keep in mind. Soldiers don't train for a competition. They don't have an in-season, OK? From a planning perspective, you can think about a deployment as a peaking phase. But what if you know a unit has deployment orders for three months from now, and all of a sudden that changes, and they have to deploy one month later? What if it gets pushed to a year later? So the point is, you have to be ready constantly. There is no one peaking time that you can sort of uh, plan for. So you have to be flexible. Differences in deployments and mission requirements plus military um, physical fitness requirements will all dictate how soldiers train. So you can't exclude endurance training from the equation. You can't exclude strength and power either. And then something that was mentioned yesterday as well, you have certain selection courses that soldiers go through, and they'll have to prepare for those accordingly. So we talked about occupational specialty requirements and the mission requirements already. I won't elaborate on that more. But one thing to keep in mind is that when a soldier is on deployment, the demands usually are far greater than what they do in training. Okay? You may re be required to carry a certain amount of weight over a patrol. Maybe you train for it using a certain loading at home. Maybe the realities faced on the battlefield are much higher than that. Add to that just the stress of being deployed um, operational stressors that you may not anticipate all make that the cumulative stress on the soldier much, much greater. Another thing to keep in mind, if you're training a soldier, you have the perfect plan, 
What happens when he decides, I'm going to go on a 15-mile road march on Friday, but it's squat day? Okay? So those kind of things are going to impact how you can train a soldier and how that soldier recovers. As we mentioned before with recovery, a soldier has to be recovered in order to train optimally. Ideally, you want 72 hours of rest when training uh, the same body part again. So using the previous, previous example, um, looking at it from either side, if you have a soldier who just did a, a long distance road march of some kind, it would probably be a bad idea to do heavy squats that same day. Or vice versa, if you put your soldier through a very demanding lower body type workout, knowing that they have a training event coming up later that week, you'd be doing that soldier a disservice from a recovery perspective. Some other considerations. Um, with soldiers, a lot of us who have been in the military any length of time will have back issues. Okay? Um, posterior chain is usually weak. Why? Because unless a soldier is in a um, specialized type of unit that has access to training resources, most soldiers will not lift, will not strengthen the posterior chain um, in the day-to-day -day course of their duties. But soldiers are faced with a lot of load carriage, uh, repetitive lifting demands of various nature. So that puts a lot of stress and strain on the back, on the spine, and the entire posterior chain. So strengthening is necessary. Best example I can give you is a study done by Roy et al. in 2012. Um, this study was looking at the types of injuries sustained by a brigade over the course of a deployment. And the basic finding was non-combat related injuries were the highest cause. So you would think, oh great, I've got an um, infantry brigade or some other combat arms, it's going to be hostile fire, right? No. It was non-combat related injuries, highest percentage, combined with lower back injuries. Top two reasons for soldiers to not be working, not be able to meet the demands of mission. Typical example is you know, load carriage when we talk about the stress placed on a soldier. In 2004, we saw a study by Dean looking at the requirements placed on soldiers during war. <coughs> this is in infantry soldiers, so 95 pounds and up of load carriage over difficult terrain with dehydration oftentimes, um, lack of sleep, nutritional factors, all of those things. So if we know that this is the demand, then that's how we have to prepare soldiers. That's how we should train. Resistance exercise itself um, can mitigate a lot of the effects of load carriage on the body. It strengthens the posterior chain. So when you are faced with carrying however much weight it is, whether it's 95 pounds or 60, your body is better, better able to handle it. Not only that, but when we resistance train, <coughs> excuse me, we can improve our muscle mass and increase the um, ability of bone, muscle, connective tissue, all of those things to better withstand the loading. So we know then that strength training is key. It maximizes the anaerobic demands, or I'm sorry, the anaerobic performance of the soldier. It improves specific task performance, load carriage, repetitive lifting. And it protects tendon, ligament, and bone, the end state being in improved per performance for the soldier overall, and like we talked about, uh, improved resilience from a physical perspective with carryover to psychological and mental factors. So at this point, I've talked enough. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kramer, and he will talk about the size principle and other training considerations. This one. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to bring home. I was a little bit under the weather last night, so I'm bringing home the, uh, the baton here with this uh, presentation. First of all, I think one of the things I just wanted to emphasize, and I've been doing this in most of my lectures over the last few years, is that we know a lot about how the body reacts physically, and size principle is one of them that we really uh, have begun to appreciate more. The work of uh, Elwood Henneman over his whole lifetime showed that the recruitment of motor units, which in fact tells you how much muscle tissue is being recruited, is directly related to the external demands, both concentrically and eccentrically. So if we use this fundamental principle, 
we really have a basic idea of what we're demanding of, of, the, of the human body when we're training. One of the things we've learned, and in fact, is that you need to rest and recover tissue that's been activated. The reason we have two major motor unit domains, type one motor units that are basically your slow twitch fibers, type two motor units, which are type two fibers and fast twitch fibers, and we recruit them in an upward linear manner going upwards until we meet the power or force demands that the task requires. And in that case, it's interesting to note that the morphology of those different units are very different too. Type one motor units are repetitively used because you always gotta go through type ones to get to type twos. And thus their non-contractile proteins are thick, they're used repetitively, the ability to actually be constantly recruited means they're very resilient. But when they're damaged, they take a longer period of time to recover and resynthesize a lot of these very uh, thick proteins, et cetera. They improve themselves based upon the reduction in degradation, whereas type two motor units rely on massive synthesis capabilities as we go forth. So if we look at the size principle of the motor cortex, much in neuroscience has been done in, with, with mammals, with humans in the, in the small muscle groups from the uh, hand to the biceps. But now I know in our laboratory we're starting to look at a lot of whole body neuroscience to tr track the whole train of events. And what you can see here is that the cortical brain stimulus is, is proximate to the activation of muscle. And then that muscle activation will determine the physiological stress. So we got a lot of external stressors, but it's the total physiological demand of activating tissue that has to be supported by cardiovascular, immune, endocrine, any other physiological system is there to support the demands of those particular motor units that have been recruited and how they're gonna be recovered and repaired. Very important fundamental concept to understand. It is that which determines the demands on the body. If you have external demands of other aspects that, in, that are invasive, such as temperature, such as dehydration, such as things that attack the musculature from the outside, those are other considerations that uh, Ms. Civic talked about. But I think the concept is, is that when we put programs together, we know what we're asking of those particular uh, motor units based upon the size principle. And I think this is imp important to understand. Also, the whole construct of heavy versus light in the study we completed, where we periodized between light programming down here, 30 to 55% versus heavy, 70 to 95%. If we look at the improvement in both the squat and the bench, you can see that you get more effect with training periodized in the heavy loads if you're trying to get stronger. If you're trying to gain endurance, then it's another question. But again, true training uses all the different elements in the toolbox to get what you're trying to get at to make the individual multitask capable. And I think the other thing is too, is one of the things on muscle fibers that people have to remember, people always wondered, and sometimes you get this information out there, that maybe when you use a light weight, you go to failure, you're gonna hypertrophy more than you think. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Really what hypertrophies the low threshold type one motor units and the type one fibers is the fact that when you lift heavy, the voltage that is going through the musculature is what is the key element that's so different when you use heavy loading versus light loading. And I think this is really important to understand you have limitations on strength development and power development if in fact you're using light weight. Power can be used when, when doing maximal speed at lighter weight, that's another issue. Force times uh, velocity is another aspect. But again, if you're just trying to get stronger, typically it's the heavier loads that are gonna be periodized into a program that you're gonna look at. So you have to have a pure design or a key to the type of program you're looking at and obviously, these are just numbers that have been put forth by many different books and research. And the bottom line is you have to be in a heavier load of 85% for improving maximal strength. Uh, you have power, you can be a little lighter, but you have to perform 
at velocity. And as uh, many have said, you train, we had a whole conference a number of NSC years ago from the NSC on power development, and you gotta train the whole spectrum of the force velocity curve. That's why you vary your load and your velocity of movements and the different aspects to meet the whole force velocity spectrum. Hypertrophy is interesting. Um, you know, it's something that we thought it was that sets of 10. You need a volume of work because if you just do ones, you seem to get a drop off. And even though you are looking at certain things, it's a neural phenomenon. So you need a certain volume of work to really get hypertrophy. And that usually comes by adding in these 75 to 85 percent loadings, which may not be done to th one to three reps, but basically are adding the work volume need to get the hypertrophy at the high voltage levels. And then with the strength endurance, here's where short rest programs come in. We've been studying this for 30 years. When you cut the rest down, you improve the enhanced endurance aspects, and you can use a little higher repetitions too. Anderson did a study way back in 1982 with the squats at 100 to 150 RM, and basically showed you get a dramatic endurance. Uh, he also showed that strength didn't really improve that much, less than 5%, so the idea of no pain, no gain uh, doesn't occur for all repetition continuum areas. So one of the things we've done, I've had a lot of work with this, and I, first of all, I think you've got to be careful. I talk with Dr. Half all the time, uh, and uh, Dr. Stone, and a variety of people. I don't, you can't really go to failure. Um, you should be close to know where you are in the training loads. If you go to failure, you're going to get a lot of joint compression, but you have to know that you're in a training zone. We've been using this with the Colts and with a lot of studies we've done. I've had a lot of interaction with a lot of military units, and that's the flexible nonlinear. And Coach Hootie at uh, Kansas has done a lot of work with this, and Dr. Fry. I think the only reason we got into this is that after dealing with intercollegiate athletics for many years, we really need to understand that we can't predict what's going to be going on, and we have to respond to the environment of that day, that week. And with the military, it's really important because as tend to brought forth, on a given day, we don't know what the unit missions are. So in order to put a program together, you have a plan over a three-month period or whatever period you know what's going on. You have a plan, but then you've got to be flexible enough to change up if, in fact, something occurs that will not allow optimal training for that workout. Going through the motions is not necessarily successful. You have to have quality training, and you don't want to waste training time doing ineffective programs. And this means that with flexible nonlinear, you may have a section where they're in a certain uh, portion of the year, and you know you get a better control. You understand that. You have different things scheduled to maybe focus on strength and power. And basically, if all of a sudden mission requirements, training requirements change, you can then alter the workouts. And this has been done both with athletics and also military as well. So the goals are very important for a given set period of time from 8 to 12 weeks. And you work with putting the different things in so that you don't get into an overreach and overtraining phenomenon. Some of the keys are prioritizing it for the individual. Now, this is tr tr trouble. I'll quote uh, John Terrine, what he did with the Colts. He had six, 65, 70 NFL football players in the weight room and basically had 65 or 75 different programs. Uh, it, it, is, it can be difficult, but again, you have to know and be aware of the fact that there's highly variable responses. Some people require, recover a lot quicker than other people from a given workout, a given thing, and they're also doing different things. So it's not easy. That is the point. And if you are creating a scenario where you have this type of what I call the hypotuitary axis adrenal stress, the, the ghost fibers of a damaged fiber take three to four days to repair themselves. This is something a lot of people don't realize. You damage a fiber every time you work out. You damage fibers. You blow them up. They have to be repaired, and there's a whole process there. But the so-called ghost fibers take about three or four days to come back. So in reality, you have to be aware that recovery is really your primary issue. And do we know everything about it? No. Are we studying it? Yes. Recovery from different aspects are really important for everything we do in the military or sports or even in physical fitness. So you got to check things prior to workouts. We're using things right now, working with some different studies. We've, we're using a check, a, 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 a vertical jump on a force plate, a vertical jump with a vertex. 
something that tells us that your performance is adequate to use this training program. If we're at 90% of our vertical jump, maybe we can do a power program that day, despite things. But if we're lost at about 50%, are we ready to do power training? That's like going out and practicing running slow to get faster. It doesn't work. So you have to have markers, even psychological ratings of how they, how they, what's going on. And they say, well, maybe the soldier or the athlete would, in fact, tell you just to get out of the workout. Well, that's a coaching issue. If they're doing that, that's a coaching issue. If you've got a guy who doesn't want to work out, that becomes a coaching issue. And that's where you have to have smart unit structures that basically understand what's going on. And I also just make a point on the low T stuff, because we're going to get into that in the military a little bit more. And I talked with uh, a few people on that. It's about the receptor. Once you decide to give a drug, you're all in, as a good uh, friend of mine made the statement yesterday, uh, Coach Stevenson, you're all in because now you've disrupted the full anabolic uh, coordinating cybernetic system. So you got to be careful with quick fixes, just as an aside here. And we're studying that right now. So we want to optimize things. Is this easy? No. That's the point I, I, I you know, I get faced with commanders and, and, and coaches and all the time. There is no easy fix. Training the human body of 100 different people is not an easy fix. And it takes a lot of knowledge. It takes a lot of work. And you're the ones that are here. I worry about the ones that are sitting there, don't read a book, don't read a paper, don't do anything. What you don't know can hurt you. I wrote a paper on that in 1984 if you want to read it. <laughs> OK, you guys are doing good. But you got to train the core exercises. you got to train the core exercises. You have to train properly so that you can, in fact, enhance what you're trying to accomplish with your program. And, you know, I, I, I see a lot of friends in the audience, the people like this, you know this, and it kind of goes from there. But you want to reduce any of the negative effects that are going on in the program. And, in fact, one of the things Coach Martin, my good friend who is battling back from cancer uh, when he was coach at UConn, you see this hierarchy on the right-hand side. When you lose quickness, that's the first thing to go. Neurologically, quickness, agility, speed, power. The last thing to go is your strength. We did a jet lag study recently. We did grip strength. Grip strength does not go. It's not a good marker of fatigue. Yeah, by the time grip strength goes, you've got to really do nasty stuff to people. So it's not a sensitive marker unless you're just talking about trash in the whole human body. And I think in this case, you need... From Dr. Fry's work and the work he did at Memphis and even at Penn State when I was there, we found we gave people one complete day of rest. We could, we could eliminate a lot of overtraining. I mean a complete day of rest. You do nothing. Sit on the couch, watch football or something. Nothing. Or watch basketball, whatever, or baseball, or nothing. I don't know. you got to have complete rest. And I think rest is, uh, is something that we in our culture does, don't really pay attention to much until you get to my age, then you like rest. <laughs> you go from there. But again, you want to eliminate the, the concerns we have. Now, these are hard to see here. One of my, uh, this will be in a, uh, Dr. Alvar put together a special issue for TSAC. It'll be out in a bit. I think this program, I believe, is that correct? Am I wrong on that? Okay, I'm right, okay. Don't want to say wrong things here. But we have all this in, the, in, in one of the articles that uh, Jesse Mala, uh, one of my, um, graduate students at UConn who did his master's with me was a ranger and uh, we put together a kind of an operational program based upon a lot of the experience of, of what he had and what we had with the rangers and Tinda and everything like this. So a lot of vets put this together. And I think what we're looking at is an off season, when we say off season, it's the type of white space that's available for a different time period, pre-deployment, and then you look at deployment and post-deployment. And there are some different ideas that you can use. But again, this is just a structural paradigm, a paradigm that you can modulate and think about and use. I, I keep, we write books, and I got a criticism one time that, well, I get a lot of criticisms. <laughs> uh, basically, I can't tell you exactly what to do. I can't give you a program. In the 1970s, People would say, give me a weight program. It was easy. Nobody knew anything in 1970. <laughs> I, I just say, here's a program. Oh, wow. Boy, I was like a superstar. It's very difficult to do that today because give me a program. There's so many different options. 
and you have to use your background and your education and your search for knowledge. And I see that in a lot of the people I know in this room, and I commend you for that because it is really a challenge and to think things through and stay on it mentally because things are changing every day. I'll give you an example. We just found out that the pituitary gland, for example, as you get older, we knew that somatotrophs got smaller. Now we're realizing that they are non-functional. And the growth hormone aggregates you need to produce can't be produced. Does that occur in other people? So there's discoveries coming out all the time. So the little GH that people think about, it's worthless. In fact, it might be a carcinogen if it's not aggregated. So there's a lot of different issues. We're discovering things every day. I gave an article to my uh, grad students on uh, irisin. Found out the assay was wrong. They did with all the hoopla that went about it two years ago. So there we get all excited about this. And, uh, it's not a wrong assay. Now we're re-examining it. So you have to be thinking of how you're using the tools and what are the fundamental core concepts that are going to carry you through. It's never right or wrong. It's when, where, why, and how, and who's going to try to implement it when it comes to military fitness training. And this is very important. But again, the nonlinear, flexible nonlinear type of phenomenon that we've had works really well for the understanding of being able to respond to the environmental changes when it's either constant or even non-constant. And then using the size principle to know what demands you're putting forth. Because just lifting light is not going to get you stronger. It may get you some endurance. But here's the other trick. When we looked at the MRI stuff, you're not activating a lot of tissue. So the thing I'll leave you with is that if you don't activate tissue, it's not trained. It just can be attacked from the outside from all the other things. That's why you need a variety of lifting protocols, heavy, light, metabolic, to be able to get at tissue from that and go from there. So finally, soldiers need to understand what the tasks are. Uh, you need cardiovascular conditioning, but you also need to be able to carry the loads and lift the loads. And I know the um, Master Fitness Trainer program and the things I've looked at over the years have attempted to do some really novel things. I'm, I'm concerned that the new load carriage requirements are a little bit crazy. Uh, we, we seem to make, we hit up at the ceiling. And one of my things, I wish I had four stars right here so I can make an uh, overview change. Just give me four stars for two weeks. Okay, I'll make some changes, you know. Uh, anyway. So tactile occupations, high stress. You can modulate this total body stress by modulating the physical demands of what you have control of. I was watching the news today, and a 100-year-old cardiologist said one of the points he gave of his life was, you got to work hard on the things you can affect and understand the things you can't affect. And I guess over lifetime, that's what we all do. We want to work hard at what we can accomplish and make an impact on. And, and you know, another thing that, that I also will leave you with is a, I'm trying, trying to be a religious guy here, but Mother Teresa had a great saying. She said, my goal in life is not to overcome, but to persist. So I continually hope that I can persist and you can persist and we can try to optimize the soldiers, the athletes, the people we work with, especially the tactical warriors and war fighters, to the best of our ability. And that's really uh, my mission in life, and I think it's yours too. Thank you very much.